Welcome to Eustick Road Church of the Nazarene in Caldwell, Idaho. This is the Sunday morning service. And now your speaker, Senior Pastor Brian Dyer. Well, we're over in Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone, if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for this town. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented a long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Let's pray. Father, thy word prevail in our hearts and in our minds. I pray, dear God, that you would speak to us what you have for us, Lord. This morning, we need to hear from you through your Holy Spirit. I pray that, dear God, each one of us would have ears to hear what we need today, Lord. Not my word. Father, may no man's word prevail, but the word of our Heavenly Father. Hide the speaker behind the cross. Speak to us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, um, I was thinking about the nature of hell. I was look, I looked up a few verses on it and stuff. And, and you know what? I had an interesting thought. Um, because I remember, a long, and I've told you this before, maybe a long time ago, some of you remember, some of you don't, it's all right, is, is that C.S. Lewis wrote a, a, about heaven and hell, and he said, he wrote this picture of, 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 of hell, and in hell they had this banquet table set up with all this food on it, and these people all sitting at the banquet table, this is in hell, and then they had these long spoons and forks on their hands, extending out like three feet past where their hand would be. So they're trying to eat, and, and in spite of the fact that all the food is on the table, they're starving to death because they can't get anything into their mouths. And then he drew a picture of heaven, and it was the same table, people sitting at the table, food all over the place, and they had the long forks and the long spoons on the ends of their arms, and everybody was eating and joyously happy because they were feeding one another. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder, you know, um, if the nature of sin is such because Isaiah, when he goes, he's, he's transported into God's throne room. He says, woe unto me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And he thinks he's going to die right there on the spot. He thinks he's dead. He's, going to, he's seeing God and he says, I'm going to die because I'm just a carnal, filthy man and, and I'm just going to die in God's presence because sin can't abide in God's presence. Isn't it interesting? I thought, I wonder if heaven and hell are the same place. You follow me on that one? Would that be intriguing? If the separation from God is so much, you know, okay, let, let me give you this one. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? That's kind of mean to do. It's kind of mean to do. But when you think about, and this is the way that I've heard it explained and I like it, is if you take butter and if you take clay and you put them both out in the sun, one becomes hard and one becomes soft. Not based upon different sunlight, but because of the nature of, of the component that it is. What if standing in front of God... You were filled with sin, you had rejected Jesus Christ, and you walked into God's presence. What would happen to you? Would I mean, you know, I was thinking about Stu's truck. He came home, and his truck, I don't know how, I've never heard of this before, but it makes sense it would happen to Stu. Is, uh, he came home, his truck had somehow spontaneously combusted in the driveway and burned up while he was away. It's like I came home, and my truck was burnt up. I mean, that was his luck. Um, uh, don't buy any lottery tickets. Is, uh, um, I wonder, I go, does sin spontaneously combust in the presence of a holy God? It, is God telling us, listen, I need you to repent of your sin, not because he's so angry about it, 
but because it just can't abide in His presence. If it is contradictory to the nature of God, I don't know. I don't know. It's just an interesting concept. Because whenever I've thought of hell, I always think the same thing you do. The weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth cast into outer darkness. Um, I don't know what all that means. I'm not ready to write a book on it yet. When I do, um, I'll sell it to you. You know, um, but uh, it was just an interesting concept that, that we are striving to be in God's presence. But if you, if you reject God and if you don't accept Jesus Christ, being in his presence would not be a blessing. Do you follow that? It would be a horrible experience for you. So God says, listen, I'm going to do you a favor and I'm going to put you someplace where I'm not. But there's only one place where God's not. So I say that because we are supposed... How many of you do believe in hell? Okay, how many of you don't? It's okay. I, I mean, you know, you know I, I've had profs that didn't believe in hell. I was really intrigued to when a professor doesn't believe in hell. You know, a Christian professor. I had atheists didn't believe in it. I mean, it was good for that. You know, I mean, it was at BSU. I had an atheist prof. He didn't believe in anything. I was okay with that. You know, but the Christians were the ones that bothered me. As I go, we have to understand that we're in the middle of a real serious situation. You know, um, and we are called to by the Lord of the harvest to be a part of the harvesters. To be a part of that. And um, as our skit showed, there are a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, but not all. I, I saw this. Uh, did you guys see this? The Death Valley Super Bloom? It, it doesn't happen very often at all, but because of the, the hurricanes and stuff, the amount of water that had come, actually Death Valley, which is usually nothing, actually bloomed this last year. If you didn't see it, it's too late. This is the only place you're going to get to see it now because I got it on video. I got it up a picture. Uh, is, here's Death Valley. It doesn't usually look like that. It usually looks like nothing at all. But right now, it was beautiful in bloom. And I just thought, this to me kind of is symbolic of what it, we're called to be as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in bringing in the harvest. We say, listen, I'm going to tell people about Jesus, but I can do that later. I can put off spiritual commitment. Well, you can't because Death Valley only blooms once in your lifetime. If you've decided to go see Death Valley, you better have done, gone last month or you missed your chance already. The scripture says today is the day of salvation, and that's for each of us. And I wonder how often people don't hear about God's grace, His goodness, because we think that we're going to do it at another time. At some later appointed time, we're going to tell people about Jesus. That's not going to work. Okay, let's get going. The harvest time. The Holy Spirit is still at work. God's, God's calling people to Him. He were, you and I were created for fellowship with God. You know, when God created mankind, I always think about that, and I put it in terms of you and I. When, when you were younger or in the future or whatever it is, wherever you're at in your journey right now, when Nancy and I were young and we said, hey, listen, we've been single and by ourselves for a few years now. We have paid off some of our debt. So now let's completely cripple ourselves financially and have children. It seemed like, you know, I mean, isn't that what you do? You say, hey, listen, I, I, children, you know, my favorite term for them, resource suckers. I mean, they, they take everything you have, they, they keep you awake at night, and somehow or another, you thought they were a good idea. I mean, seriously, when we vote for our president, he should always be a single guy, no wife, no kids. I'm just telling you, uh, you know, or if it is a husband and wife team, no children, you go, he's had kids. There's something wrong with that guy. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Why did you have kids? Why did you have kids? And you thought it was a wonderful idea, too. And you, and you were, and here's the funniest thing about it. When you decide to have children, before they're born, before they are born, before you're even expecting them, you're in love with them. You're in love with them. You know, and when a, when a woman is expecting this baby, she starts loving that baby long before the baby is ever born. That doesn't make any sense economically. It doesn't. It's a horrible idea. Children, in spite of the tax write-off, they're a bad, bad, bad investment. You're not going to get any sleep. They are horrible. Everything about them, they're terrible. And what do they do in repayment? That's how they pay you back. They cry. And trust me, folks, when they get to be teenagers, it's worse. But you did it. Why? 
because you knew, you knew you were going to have a relationship with this little person and you loved them and you were in love with what was going to come. Before anything else, you were in love with that child and you would, you would give your life for that baby before you ever knew it. That's how God is with us. When he created mankind, he said, man, I'm going to love them. They're going to be my children. Ah. I, before you ever came into existence, God was in love with you. And he created mankind in the garden, and he's got this relationship, and then they rebel against him. And he says, I, I can't have you in my presence. I want to, but I can't. Your nature is now not the same as mine, and it'll damage you to be with me. We've got to change you. We've got to change you back to an image that works for me so that you can be with me. They gave the Ten Commandments. You guys know how good we do at that, right? You guys ever do the inventory of how well you've done with the Ten Commandments? It's not a pretty sight. Um, you know, it's the violation of those, man didn't do very well. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from ourselves, from, from the nature of our own sin. The Holy Spirit is still at work. People are still being led by the Spirit. God is at work still calling people to Himself. The Scripture says, no one comes to the Lord except He is drawn by God. The fact that you're here today is not a coincidence. The fact that God is drawing you to this place is not just happenstance. We don't just wander around. If you're led by the Lord, if you're listening at all, it's not a matter of you just doing what you want to with a total disregard. God said, listen, I'm going to put somebody across your path and they're going to say something to you. And you're going to yield to that. And you listened. And you're here. And God is speaking to you. I hope. If you're listening, if you have ears to hear. But what if God is calling and no one is listening? What if God is calling workers and he's calling you and he's calling me and he's telling us to go tell somebody about Christ, to go and share the love of Jesus Christ with somebody, but we're not listening. We're not listening. You know, I, I pray for my family. I love my family. Not this family. I love them. God's a given. But I mean my extended family in Florida. I love them. I love them. I love them. But I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I'm not there with them. I can't, I can't minister to them. I can't, I can't preach to them. I can't do anything. And if I do, I'm not that effective anyway, to be honest with you. Because it's my mom and my brothers. And, and when there's no place that you're, a, a prophet's not without honor except in his own country. When I go back there to them, my mom, she never calls me Pastor Brian. She just says Brian. I says Pastor Brian to you, lady. Okay, okay, I can't minister to them. I can't. I can't, if nothing else than geography, I'm too far away. So I have to be faithful where God has called me to be. And I, and I am trusting and praying that there are people who are being faithful where God has called them to be, who are ministering to my family, who are reaching other people that I love dearly more than myself, because I can't. But you see, if you and I are not reaching out and we're not sharing the love of Jesus Christ with the people around us, we have no claim and we don't have a prayer. We don't have a reason to be praying that somebody else will be faithful because we're unfaithful. It's our own fidelity, it's our own faithfulness that prompts us to have the confidence to go before our Heavenly Father and to make a request of Him. But if a man is double-minded, he has no, no reason whatsoever to have confidence in his prayers. You know, So God's calling, what if no one is listening? The harvest is plentiful, would you agree? Would you agree that there are a lot of people who need to know Jesus Christ? You know, it's a funny thing because this, the good shepherd, he's got the sheep, right? He's got the sheep in the fold. What's he do when one of them gets out? What's he do? He leaves. He leaves the 99 to go look for the one, right? Did you know that Christianity is a minority religion in the world? Do you know what that means? That means that the 99 have gotten out of the pen and we're hanging on to the one. It's, 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 it's not even that we go, hey, we got to go look for that stray one. No, we, we, we got to go look for the stray 99, folks. The harvest is plentiful. When I was in the military, people say, is it tough to be a Christian amongst non-Christians? I said, yeah, it's like being a cow in a cornfield. There are people who need Jesus Christ, and there are lots and lots of opportunity that God gives me to share with folks. You can't do that if you're selfishly motivated, if you're not thinking about other people, but God will bring people across your path, opportunities across your path, chances for you to witness to folks. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ alive in you. You can model the love of Jesus Christ not any time, but all the time. It's who you are, I hope. 
It should be, right? Because God is still at work and the harvest is plentiful. The groundwork has already been done. If you're going to plant a seed, if you're going to have a harvest, the first thing you got to do is break the fallow ground, right? you got to break it up. Jesus Christ has already done that. All the heavy lifting has already been done. Everything that's going to be difficult for us to do has already been accomplished. You and I are called to the harvest, but we're not the harvest. We're, we're just called to be a little piece of it. God desires the harvest. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. How do we feel about that? God's not willing that any should perish. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with people perishing? Or does it bother us too? If it doesn't bother us that folks are not going to make it into heaven, we may have a problem with how in line with our, the Holy Spirit we are. We should call ourselves something else. You know, um, because Christians have to be Christ-like. And do our lives reveal that conviction? You know, everything about you should be, you know, okay, let me, get, let me pull something up. I'm grabbing, okay? Uh, but I want, I, I want an illustration on the fly here. Is, okay, uh, no, no, this is me. I'll, I'll stay away from you guys. Uh, okay, I was, walking, I was walking down the street. I was walking on the sidewalk. And uh, I, I, I heard a lady screaming. This is an old one, but I like it. I was, I was walking down the sidewalk. I heard this lady screaming. She was like more angry screaming. I was like, dude, somebody's angry about something here. And so, and you do the same thing, don't you? When you hear somebody screaming like that, we were walking through a parking lot and I heard somebody screaming like yesterday. And I turn and I look to see what's going on, to see what the commotion is first, you know, checking it out. So as I'm walking, I hear this lady screaming. It's like, whoa. And, and I realized, I mean, it's coming from inside of a house. The lady inside, this, inside her home yelling so loud, I'm out on the sidewalk, I can hear it. So I did what you would have done. I walked over and peeked in the window. <laughs> right, Sandy? Which is what we'd, we'd, people like us do. I see this lady in there screaming at these two little kids. So I do the same thing you would have done. I walk over and knock on the door. You know, and she opens the door and I say, hi, is everything okay? And she says, um, yeah, everything's fine. And I said, why? It doesn't sound like it. Ah, she starts crying and I go in and I visit with her and she tells me about her life and where she's, how she's gotten to where she's at and some really horrible things that she's in the midst of. And I pray and lead her to Christ before I leave, you know? That's who we are. That's who we are. You know, people are lost and they're, and they're searching for something and you have the answer. You have the answer. You have the fact that we can be forgiven for our sins. You have the fact that Jesus Christ tells us he's already defeated the world and we walk around uncertain of what we're supposed to do. Afraid that if we talk to somebody, we're going to interrupt their day. They're going to be offended at you or their feelings are going to be hurt. Well, sometimes they were. Sometimes, I mean, like, I've, I've had times, I had a guy, I was, I was talking to him about Jesus, and he got angry. Don't tell me about God! Arr, you Christians make me so angry. I don't care. You know, you know what, I've never seen the guy again in my life. I mean, you know, it didn't, I mean, you know, I mean, I saw him a couple times on the boat, it was it. it, was it. You know, but I knew where he was at, it's okay. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I'm not a peddler of Jesus Christ. If the guy doesn't want to hear about Christ, he can, you can burn in hell if you want to. You know, I mean, I, I can't stop you if the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is not enough to motivate you. My words aren't going to add anything to that, to that. I mean, it wasn't my will, but he got angry at me. You know why he probably got angry? I don't know, but over the years I've thought, I think he probably got angry because he was under conviction of some sort. He knew better than what he was doing, and I reminded him of what he was supposed to be doing, and he probably got angry at me because I was a reminder, and I bothered his heart convictions. You know what I mean? Some people get angry with you because you bother their conscience. You go, hey, you should be living the way you're supposed to. And they go, ah, and you go, oh, okay. my bad. Do what you're not supposed to, then that's going to work out well. The time for harvest is yesterday. It's yesterday. It's not today. It's not today. It's yesterday. You guys ever, you guys ever um, see crop on a tree that's been on there too long? Oh, man. You know, in the, in the bottom of your refrigerator, they got those, what are they called, freshers? Freshers, isn't that what it's called? Freshers, fresher compartment? They should call that the water. You know, it is nothing fresh. It's not a fresher. It's the, that's where 
fruit goes to die. And you open it up, and there's stuff in there, and you go, oh, that's not right. You know, and you, you go, hey, Danielle, come and pick this up, would you? <laughs> there's something in this, there's a vegetable in here, and it's furry. And I, I don't eat furry vegetables. That's just wrong, you know? When, it, when it's been in there too long, when it's just, it's just should have been used already, you know? And there's stuff on the tree. We, you know, we planted a bunch of, we planted tomatoes last year. Our tomatoes plant did huge, wonderful. You guys ever plant tomatoes? You ever plant, like, we planted one plant. That's all we planted, one plant of cherry tomatoes. I'm telling you, in the future, I'm trimming that thing back. I'm going to trim it back like a rose bush. Those things, it took off and it owned half of my garden. And all it did was just drop these little nasty cherry tomatoes everywhere. They were good. Like two of them, you know, three. I mean, like we could eat 10 a week maybe. You're like, And if we weren't getting a thousand a week, it would have been wonderful. You know, and they're just rotted all over the ground. And you know what I think is I think this. I think that that's how God calls us. He calls us to be these ministers of grace, and we don't answer. Then what's happening to the fruit? What's happening to the harvest? Folks, the harvest is rotting. It's only ripe for a short time. We can miss that window of opportunity when the harvest is right. When the time is right, when, we're, when people are asking questions, and they say, okay, so tell me about this Christianity. What does this death of Jesus Christ on the cross mean to us? And we have those questions. We have those answers. We have the chance to tell them. And we say, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, I don't want anybody to be hurt or, or, or disgruntled with my answer. So we become these little whiners. You know, we, don't, we, don't, we make Christianity about something that it's not. I don't know what we turn into. We turn into consumers who think that it's all about what we get, not about what we give. But God is prepping you. He's preparing you to be this powerful, awesome minister of Jesus Christ. And instead, we come to church and we become these consumers. Consumers. You and I are not meant to be that. God called you into the family of God, not into the marketplace of God. You can be a consumer when you go to Albertsons or when you go to Winco. You're not a consumer when you come here. You are, you are a member of what's going on. And God is changing you. Here it is. So intercession. You want to harvest something, you're going to have to sow something. And we as Christians have to be a people of prayer. We're praying for God, and we're, and we're praying for God's will in people's lives. You know, we've walked there before. We know what it's like to walk outside of the will of God. We know what that looks like. We know that the, the damage that can be done to our own souls. We can, we can become people who, are, who have hurt ourselves. Not somebody else inflicting damage. Somebody outside of you can hurt you. You know, something mean can be done to you, but the worst things that happen in life, the worst damage to your own soul happens when you do it yourself. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced of that. Um, it's been my experience, you know. Somebody else does something mean, you can, you can just go, well, that was their problem. That was something they did. But when you do something that's wrong, who do you get to blame then? You know, was it Flip Wilson, wasn't it? The devil made me do it. Wasn't that him? The devil made me do it. Well, good luck. So intercession. Tend to the crop with compassion. Love people around you. Jesus, Jesus Christ loves you. You are made in the image of God. You are to love people. It's what you do by nature. You just love people. And if I, I believe truthfully that if we follow that as, a, as, a, as our mantra, we'll do what we're supposed to do. You know, something, you go, well, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. You follow the Lord, listen to Him, and you will do what's right. You'll do it. You'll do what's right. You'll have the right words to say at the right time. You know, and when you don't, you'll recapture that too. That's okay, you know. And then go into the fields. Now, don't wait for the crop to come to you. You know, too often we're going to pray for somebody and then wait for them to come to church. It's not about somebody coming to church. It's about people coming to Jesus. And honestly, here's the truth. Ready? You're pretty close to Jesus. You are. You, you are, you're all the Jesus they need. Maybe. Now, don't, I'm not trying to be blasphemous with that. We're going to point them to the foot of the cross. 
but they are going to see Jesus Christ in you. And if they don't, if they don't, then you have to ask why not. You have to ask why not. Why am I not, why am I not pointing them to Jesus? If they're not, you need to pray about that and get that right. You need to get that right. Do you follow that? Do you follow that? They, they can see Christ in you, and then they'll want the real thing too. Okay. Go into the fields, don't wait for the crop to come to you, and when's the time? The time is now. That's the crop if we wait any longer. Not a, not a complex, not a complex message for you this morning. Jesus Christ has called you to go. He's called me as well. Harvest is right. Time is now. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, dear God, for your blessings. I pray, dear Father, that we would be bold, Lord, as, as, as fierce as, as lions and as harmless as lambs. God, may we love people. May they see Jesus Christ alive in us. And Lord, when we encounter folks who are struggling, when we see people who are, who are enslaved in sin, who have been taken captive by the devil, and they don't even know their way out, Lord, may we not be judgmental. May we not be those Christians who, who offer judgment more than grace. But dear God, may we explain to people, may we have a heart that desires for the whole world to know the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be those models. We give you the glory the praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you, my friends. You're dismissed. Shake hands and be friendly. Thanks for joining us today. You can find Eustick Road Church of the Nazarene on the web at eusticnaz.org and on many social media sites at Eustick Naz. Thanks and God bless.